Javi, I can't believe you just said that. Well, he, I told you. No, All right, forget it. We're going. Come on, Alexa, let's go. You have to maintain yourself. Have to maintain yourself. Don't ever bring your son here. Shut up! Hey! <laughs> she was upset! I don't care! You don't hit her! Really? Because no, you don't want the fuck it's wild. Damn it! Stop it! <laughs> Stop! No! Ow! Stop! Come on, the good mood. Okay! The hell, why? <laughs> Up. Oh my god. Alexa! Damn it, Ethan, knock it knock it off now. Now! No, don't go back. Get the fuck oh, out Ethan, of here. Shut up! I'll kick your ass! God damn it, stop! Get the chair away. Shut up! <laughs> stop! I'm a sack! Okay. You can be angry at Uncle Tavi. You don't need to be angry at Alexa. Because I'm not in the freaking asshole. Hey, but she didn't do anything. You're not in the freaking asshole mood! been trying for years to get help for my son. I, I was desperate. And I thought I was the only mother in the entire world who felt the way I did. The only mom. How can I not get my child help? Surely all the other mothers are getting their child help. Why not me? What's wrong with me? You know, I used to worry that, that, that Gus was going to wind up in a jail or a hospital. Or, or homeless. Um, all of those would be preferable to, to the situation I'm in now. If um, a state senator, um, someone who's run for governor, whose name's been in every paper of the Commonwealth, if I can't get the help, what does that say about ordinary people? We don't treat mental illness the way we treat it, other diseases. And so the care is just not available. Somebody once said that a serious mental illness is any mental illness that affects somebody you love. And in a way, there's something to that. I'm in a good mood. For people who have serious mental illness and who are not treated, there's a tendency to violence, especially towards the people that they're closest to, and most of all, towards themselves then only about half of the children who have a mental disorder are going to receive any kind of care whatsoever. I get is people that want to just sit there and lecture me. I need to do this. Do you understand that this that your son is going to do this and that your son is this way? Like, do you understand? Like, as if as if I'm in denial of something, as if I might be able to get some extra help, but I'm just not wanting to. And it is so frustrating and so exhausting. I can only stick to my guns so far, Tavi, because it becomes too dangerous. And that is why you're right. Giving in to him. In the end, in the end, it is the best idea because it does make him more manipulative and more worse, yes. But, but not getting into him when he's really persistent is also just as dangerous. And that is why the behavioralist already said that he doesn't believe that anything I can do at this point. He doesn't believe that any consequence. He doesn't believe I can do anything myself at this point. You think this, Tavi, you think that, but I hate to say it, you, you think that, but it isn't the same. You can train a dog easier than a child like this. <laughs> when he started being aggressive, he was only about two and a half, three. I was worried then. 
you ask a doctor, they can't tell you what he'll be capable of. They don't know where he's going to go or what direction he's going to take. I just can't help myself because it's just what I usually do. I don't know how to control my anger. Gosh, I'm leaving some with life. What'd you say? I said if only if there was a lifeguard who could help me try to control myself. Because you know lifeguards are good, right? Yeah, they save everyone, even when they drown. Monte is 12, or he'll be 12 in October. In the beginning, he was talking about he just wanted to die. Now he's talking about hurting other people. He don't express himself verbally, but he's real good at expressing himself in writing. So if he gets upset and I go in the room and I see all these signs all over the bed, I hate myself and, you know, I can't control myself and, you just stuff like, you know, I'm no good and I'm better off dead and stuff like that. I don't never take stuff like that as just talk. I feel like if it's in you and you saying it, then it's a possibility. That's how I feel. Because why would you say something like that? I'm just doing my part on my end to make sure he knows that I love him and to know that I'm there for him. At the time of the school shootings, my son had been in acute care psychiatric hospital for two days. It is the scene of one of the worst school shootings in the history of the United States. And we can report to you that police have now identified a school shooter as Adam Lanza. Police are trying to determine a motive. They say the shooter killed his mother, then broke into Sandy Hook Elementary Friday morning, killing 20 children and six women using an assault-style rifle. Even before the shooting, Adam Lanza, seen here in a photo taken seven years ago, was known in the neighborhood as a troubled child with an overbearing mother. My son played with him when they were young. And in her home, I know she was very particular. Um, I just think she maybe had too high of standards or something. That day of Newtown, something broke. I, I sat down and I wrote my truth. The truth that my family was living, that I was living, that I was afraid of my son. And the mother of a mentally ill child getting backlash for a blog posting with the title, I am Adam Lanza's mother. The post went viral in it. Liza Long says her aim was to describe the challenge of raising a child who she says is seriously disturbed. Most people with autism and most people with schizophrenia are not inherently dangerous. But we do ourselves a grave disservice if we deny the fact that some people in these communities behave in ways that are traumatic. And I think we need to support their families. I knew right where the dialogue was going to go. They were going to say, this was Nancy Lanza's fault. Why didn't she get her son help? Why didn't she this? Why didn't she that? But I felt immense empathy for Nancy Lanza. I think people insist on the narrative of blame, in part because they want to believe that these things are caused by poor parenting. Because if it's caused by poor parenting, then you can know that you're a good parent and it won't happen to you. And I think that's a false comfort. Okay, you want me to go with you? All right. Alexa, come upstairs. Mary, out. Go. Who is the good boy? All right, we'll let you keep him contained. You are the good boy. You want to sit down, Ethan? You want to play? He really bothers everyone. No, he's not bothering everyone. Well, I know, but see how. Hi! Did you just tell Mary? Oh my god! I love this song! Like Ozzy? No, I like this song. 
What song is this? Pink Floyd. I was going to say this is Pink Floyd. Oh yeah, I, I, I love this song. This dark segment. Seriously, I like this song. No, not these. No, shush, you guys. I like this song. She just wants you guys to listen to her. Shut up, Alexa. Stop. Okay. We're not going to yell, all right? I hate her. That's why. Not your sister. Shut up. You don't Shut up. I will kill you. Do you think I want to go outside, honey? Shut up. God damn it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna freaking punch you, Alexa, if you don't stop. No, you stop it. Stop. Now. I just can't handle this. If <sighs> one wrong word sends me into a psychotic rage where I've got no control over myself, and it's like watching myself do things that I didn't want to do. And then afterwards, I rem I either completely forgot, I like I'd block all the memories because it was too painful to remember, or I would remember and that would be even more painful because um, I would have memories of myself doing it even though I didn't want to, even though I had no control, I still accused myself of doing it. There's just been countless episodes with him, and I just see the the uh, the anger and the um, the violence getting progressively worse. Can he turn to family? Well, sure, but when he acts like that, no. I can't have my child exposed to that, and I have to be protective of my child. I think my my nephew needs professional help. I don't even know if it's anything Stacy can do anymore. I can't keep defending him. I can't. I can defend him so far. But I can't expect the rest of the world to not get upset or just forgive him or just deal with it. I can't expect that. I never did. He constantly threatens he's going to kill somebody. And when people hear that, it sends them into a mode. You don't know if he's serious. If somebody comes up to you and gets mad at you and tells you, I'm going to effing kill you, I'm going to beat your ass, I'm going to find a gun and shoot you. Whether he would do it or not, you don't know. But you, the fact that somebody would say that to you and you're sitting there wondering, are they capable of it? Mom, come here. Hold on. Mom, be quiet, Ethan. No, you. And he hits me and he pulls my hair and he kicks me and he pulls my arm to the wall and he pushes me to the wall and he beats me up like that. And one time um, Josh, my mom's boyfriend, he got really mad at him, Ethan, he got really mad at him and so um, Josh has guns that he hides only for bad guys and he then found one so he picked it up and it had no bullets in it but he picked it up. The very last thing that I want to do that any parent wants to do especially at 10 years old is think about or have to put their child in, a, in an institution or in a home to give them up. That's not what I want to do but I am at the point and it is as bad that if, if, if nothing else, it, I don't know that I have a choice. It's becoming more than a safety issue. I have a daughter. I have to protect her, and I can't.
whole deinstitutionalization process was driven by two things. One, we wanted to save money. And second, we wanted to restore people's civil rights and treat them in the community. Well, we closed the institutions down, but we didn't really adequately follow through with ensuring that they're adequate supports in the community. And the problem is, we, don't, we just don't have enough beds right now. We went from about 600,000 beds. Today, there are less than 60,000 public beds for people with serious mental illness. It's raised the question about does there need to be a new kind of institution, maybe not like the old asylums, but uh, places where kids, young adults, or even older adults could go for short periods of time to get more comprehensive care. I think there aren't enough options available to people. There is the sense that rehabilitation is a luxury for people who have a lot of money or who live in states in which there are particularly good programs because we have regional networks and in some places there's rehabilitation and in some places there's almost none. William, this is the first time that I've got a chance to meet with you and we went to Harmon the other day, like since January. Yeah, months. Gosh, you have had a really very busy year, huh? Rough time. It has been a rough time. Yeah. It's been a really rough time. Uh-huh. Yeah. And yeah. you really want to get back to kind of a more normal life, huh? Yeah. yeah. Why can't I? Well, you know what? That's a very good yeah. question. I met William at the age of 12. He has a mild intellectual disability and, and also, in addition, a mild autism spectrum disorder. He's also diagnosed with a schizoaffective disorder. And, and that is the condition where he can, especially when really emotional and really elevated and what we also say dysregulated, um, he can really start to lose touch with reality and um, have some pretty delusional thinking can experience auditory hallucinations. Since January, you've been down to... Um, it was first Children's Hospital, and then Jefferson Hills, and yeah. then Denver Children's Home, then Denver Health, and then El Pueblo. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah. That's been a rough time, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I wasn't eating anything at all. Mm -hmm. I, I was getting skinny to the point of mouth. All I was doing was watching my videos, staying up all night. I was in horrible shape. By the time I got there, they noticed I was skinny, t dangerously skinny to the point of malnutrition. Mm -hmm. What was going on that, that made all of those trips to Children's Hospital and El Pueblo and Denver Children, why were all those places necessary? Because my behavior went downhill. Yeah, what kind of behavior? Damaging property. Cops had to come over. Yeah. I was constantly kicking and screaming and hitting. Yeah. Yeah. I was scared to death. We end up calling the police when he is so out of control that he's not listening to reason anymore and he's becoming um, dangerous to himself or us or his sister. And so um, when he starts throwing lamps or throwing the TV or things like that, then we have to call the police. So remember when we um, when we were at Children's? Yeah. And we said from Children's, we were probably going to step down to a residential. Yeah. And then work our way home. Yeah. So we started that process when we were at Children's. Yeah. And when you got out of Children's, the home wasn't ready. Yeah. It became ready. What do you mean? That the home that's right before you staying home with us is ready for you now. It's available. And it's it's a good thing. I'm, I'm going. Yeah, it's the best thing for right now. It's the step down from going to children's to staying home full time. Okay. Okay, and it's really close to home, mm -hmm. William. It's very close what to home. What is it? It's a, it's a house. Yeah. You have your own bedroom. What is it? It's a home. I don't want to go. What, what is it that you are worried about? I'll behave at home. I've been doing great. I really don't. You have been doing really well. You've been doing better. You've been doing better. But there's better. still there's still some things that need to mature and and get completely safe. Question. Yes. 
Why are you trying to make my parents more strict with me? Strict? Am I trying to make them more strict? Yeah. What does strict mean? What do they do on that mean that that is that's strict? I don't know, but but you, you've been doing this since we've started seeing you. Can you yeah. tell me why? Well, this is big news, huh? Yeah. yeah. Very I mean, I'll do anything not to go. You've been working really, really hard. We know you've been working hard, William, and I know your intention is to behave. There's just still some things that you can't quite help, and they're there to help you with that. I don't want to go. I'm going to ask you to do something, okay? What? I want you to trust us. Because right now, you... Don't make me go. I want you to just trust that we're making the best decision. I'm going to act up there and get restrained. Because this is a step that we need to take to get home. Okay, we're almost there. And, and use your skills right now, okay? Because we want you to remain safe. Yeah. We'll just give you a little bit of a break. Yeah. That's just a little bit. Yeah. He needs somebody there 24 hours a day to help him through the emotional roller coasters he goes through. You know, we can only do so much. We have, you know, work and we have a daughter and other things to tend to. And um, he needs this amount of care right now. Residential treatment is sometimes the only option. And I think the hard part for parents, I've watched some of my own friends go through this, is to accept it again, to say, you know, no, this isn't that you were a bad parent. This is the appropriate treatment for your child. In the very worst cases, sometimes states will require you. Nobody likes to hear this. Sometimes states will require you to sign your child over to the state. So you're, you're giving up your child just so your child can get care. I'm here, uh, and uh, we wanted an update on that case you talked about. Our bureau responds to all the uh, critical incidents in LA County. Uh, the most commonly known thing that we have is our psychiatric mobile response team, which provides uh, evaluations of individuals who are suicidal, homicidal, or gravely disabled. Wow, the boy, the boy's an enigma. I mean, the mom says that this kid is writing about death and particularly uh, being killed by police. But he's also talking about killing himself, right? Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, he, he uh, but he denied everything. He denied about, you know, making the gesture to the teacher. Now, the mom says that, you know, yeah, he's got, he's got behavioral problems, but never threaten anyone. Hi, Ms. Kern, how you doing? Hi. Can I come in? Yes, come in. Great, great, great. This is Bonte. What's your first name? Vate with the V. Vate, how you doing? Mm -hmm. Do you know who I am? Nope. Never met me, me neither. My name's Tony. Well, the reason we came by is that we're really uh, interested in going, what's going on with you and trying to figure out how we can help you and your mom. Maybe we can start by you telling me what's going on. Nothing. Everything's OK? Mm hmm Well, that's not what we heard, and that's why we're here. I feel like he's a kid with so much bottled up inside of him, so much anger. And some of the things he writes in the letters and on the paper is saying, OK, something is wrong. I need some help. There's something going on with me. Somebody please help me. Yeah, your mom said that you got a lot of anger inside. You think it, that's what it is? No, I got no anger. What do you think it is? I don't know. Maybe a lot of hurt? Probably. Yeah, Miss Daddy? Yeah, of yeah. course. That's tough, man. You've been through a lot. What, what worries you the most? <sighs> you know, what worries me the most is <sighs> I don't want to see him on the news as one of those kids 
that didn't get the help that he was supposed to get and, and it leads to destruction. Just, that's what I don't want to happen. I mean, that's what I'm afraid of. He didn't really know his father, but I think his father has such a great impact on me and the kids. They got Chesie. Well, it wasn't a shootout. The police shot him. He, wasn't, he didn't have no gun. His father went to the fish market on, on Crenshaw and Manchester. And I guess he fit one of the profiles of the, the gang member, and they had him uh, had him to get against the car, and had his hands on the car. And um, he, he turned around and told him that because he, he didn't like wearing belts, and he was a pretty big man. So they told him, well, he was telling them that he needed to pull his pants up. And when he pulled it, when he was reaching to pull his pants up, I guess they thought he had a gun, and then they started shooting. And then when they went to look, it wasn't a gun. He was pulling up his pants, and it was like he was, he had some alcohol in a bag, but it wasn't alcohol, it was a soda. Um. He does have a lot of strikes against him, so there's no doubt about that. But, but the question becomes, what can we wrap around him so that he can have the right kind of guidance as things get a little more complicated. Well, he so. has the predisposition of substance abuse as well. Yeah, yeah, the whole you thing. Know. He's got everything. So he's got the dad's death in his head and the ultimate solution, suicide by cop, mm -hmm. right? You know, one of the things that we are going to push is for, in September, uh, for a more, I would say, comprehensive assessment of uh, Vontae. I don't know if, you know, there's some sort of psychosis or not. Right now, he's got the diagnosis of bipolar. But, you know, it's still something that they, they really need to tease out. What? what? I've been doing so good at home. You're being unreasonable. OK. Hey, Julie. Why do you want me to go so bad? Be, re be ne negotiate. I've been doing so good at home. Yes. Yes. I'm not going. No. No. We know this, that illnesses that are involve psychosis, where people become irrational, they may become frightened, um, they may become highly, highly paranoid, they can be dangerous. That's part of the disorder. We understand that. That's why it's so important that they be treated, because when they are treated, there is a profound reduction in risk. And in fact, at that point, it's much more likely they're going to be hurt by somebody else rather than them hurting somebody else. I'm not on staying home! Like ah! 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 Call okay. the cops, have them come over and take okay. me. You don't have to do that. I thought I was staying home! William. I thought I was staying home! Let me stay home or I'll start threatening to hurt myself. Ah! 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 Ah, don't take me. I can't drive with you like that. The police are here. <laughs> I want to live at home. I want to be at home. I want to be at home. I miss home. I want to be at home. I can tell you there's nothing harder than watching your 11-year-old child be handcuffed and pushed into the back of a police car because of what you know is just a behavioral symptom. I can't tell you how many parents have described to me having to call the police on their kids and have said to me, it was the hardest, saddest thing that I ever had to do in my life, to call the police to come in to discipline my own child whom I couldn't control felt to me like the biggest failure I had ever known.
mean, this has been just about every month for, I don't know, almost a year now. And Bill's going there. And then I'm going to take over for Bill. We do shifts, so he'll stay with him in ER until I get there. And then I'll relieve him for a few hours so that he can get a little bit of work done. When puberty hit, he just went into mental illness. It was more a mix between autism and anxiety disorders and things like that. And then somewhere around puberty, he started hearing voices. And um, pretty scary voices, actually. Like telling him, I want you to do what James Holmes did. William is fascinated with James Holmes. He's fascinated with the story. Uh, I think it scares him because he stayed at Children's Hospital and he knew that James Holmes lived nearby. And, um, and I think in a way he's kind of testing to see is he as bad as James Holmes? Because he's asked that a few times. Am I as bad as him? Am I going to end up like him? His hair still bright orange, James Holmes stared blankly and yawned in court today where for the first time his lawyers claimed he is mentally ill. The past several weeks have seen another deadly outbreak of mass shootings, part of an epidemic of senseless violence that's now occurring on a regular basis. It's become harder and harder to ignore the fact that the majority of the people pulling the triggers have turned out to be severely mentally ill. There's every reason to think that there's something about the way the brain's functioning that leads to the symptoms that you see. That's important to us because what we've learned in the case of heart disease is that you have to get past the symptoms. You have to begin to look at the mechanisms of disease. It's like giving um, painkillers to someone who's got chest pain. You can give them a way to relieve the short-term pain. But what you really want to do is figure out what's wrong with their heart and figure out how to make sure that they're getting the best heart function possible. The same can be said for mental illness. I'm going to be meeting with the case manager and the two people from the program. Just, it's a meet and greet pretty much. They're going to come over, tell me about the program, what to expect, what's going to be going on. I mean, I would like if you guys would look at his medicines yeah. and if you felt like you might want to try something else, whether it even be with the ADHD, because it's like, I, I, for a long time, I guess I was hoping there'd be a medicine that would fix it. When people are like, oh, Abilify has this calming nature and da da da. When I don't see that, I'm like, how do I know if it's working? I don't know. Is he supposed to be breaking his doors and having these meltdowns? I, right. I don't know. Ethan has attention deficit disorder, hyperactive attention deficit disorder, ADHD, and oppositional defiance disorder, known as ODD, and with the underlying diagnosis of autism. So he's on the spectrum. He's high functioning, but just on the spectrum. It's almost like I kind of feel like at times I forced the other symptoms into play with the doctor saying, look, he's obviously, there's something else going on. Like, like right now, they say they won't diagnose him with bipolar, he's too young, but even if he's on meds that, are, that people with bipolar would take. It's almost like a Ouija board experience, right? Where you take your child into the specialist, it's like, woo, they interview him for a while, they give him a bunch of little tests, and then, I don't know, they're like, woo, oppositional defiant disorder, that's what it is today. You're like, okay, what do we do for that? Well, we're gonna take this drug and this drug and this drug. And my child, I think he'd been on 12 or 13 different drugs again by the time he was 12 years old. A lot of these medications aren't tested in children. Many of them are off-label. Sometimes they're like for blood pressure or something. And that's a frightening experience for a parent. At this point, a lot of the time, someone guesses at a diagnosis, medicates for it, oh, the medication didn't work, therefore you probably don't have that syndrome, let's try another one. And it feels like the child is a dartboard and you're sort of thinking, we'll throw this, we'll throw that. Oh look, that one seems to help. Okay, I guess you must have this. And the diagnosis is the result of a medication response rather than the basis for the assignment of a medication. Hey, Ethan. Hey, why don't you sit down because they're going to leave soon. We want to tell you something. Go, uh, wait, we want to talk to, wait, no, I need to talk to you about something mm -hmm. with them. 
Sit down. I have. I want to use my. Okay, weed. I'll tell you what. You can, but first they're gonna leave, and we need to talk to you about something important. So could you just sit down? Thank uh, you. I wanna okay, go. Okay, listen. On the listen. Ride. Listen. First, let me talk to you. So, these are gonna be your new counselors. Okay, and then this is the thing, honey. You're gonna start seeing them next Monday, but they are actually in Lakewood, which is past Tacoma, okay? And you're gonna go and stay with them for a while. Stay with them? Like live with them. They're gonna try and help you control those anger problems you have, because you always say you wanna try and control yourself and you don't know how, and they're gonna try to help you. So you're gonna stay there for a while. For Cause they're just helping. They are. So you're gonna live with them for a couple months. All right. That's Wait, is there gonna be everyone? No. It's not a hospital, it's a house. It's a nice house. It's a, it's nice a house. very nice house. So do you think you are going to be a big boy and you're going to let them help you? I'm going to take you to this place, okay? What? To their place. Next Monday? Next Monday. You're going to start living there for a little while. Until three months? Or six, we don't know. It just days. depends on you. No, months. Like 90 days to 180 days. Yeah, I don't think it's really sinking in, but at okay. least he's taking it pretty well. That's good. Mitch's dog is always in trouble. So this poor thing is always staying at Red Hill. This is the facility that his, Mitch's dog is in. And he has all these reports for all the people that come in here. He processes his experiences. So, um, and, and how he does that is he role plays. So he's made this into a residential facility and the dog, you know, needs to fill this out, name, gender, age, and why he's here. And then sometimes they go to juvenile home. Sometimes they're, they're going to children's hospital, things like that. So he role plays in order to process, I think. you're going to be staying and you're not going to see me for a long time and you want to act like this in the car? I don't want to see me. You don't want to see me? Okay. Well, guess what? You're not going to get to, Ethan. Why don't you think about that? Look, Ethan, that's the house you're going to stay at. Okay. Hey, Ken. Um, this is Ethan. He's trying to call you. Because um, today I'm, I'm not being with mom anymore, and I'm not allowed to bring my electronics. I, I have to leave, and I'm not going to be with mom anymore. Maybe, right? I live so, I live super far away with someone else, and that's all I wanted to say. So bye, Ken. I'm going to miss you. It's my turn. Mm. 
I love you. I'm gonna miss you so much. Me too. I really am gonna miss you. You're my baby boy. You're. Hey, William. What? Remember what I said. This is temporary. Yeah. I'm gonna find a place for us, okay? And okay. you're gonna be fine. You've done this before. Where is it? It's right here. That it? Mm-hmm. Look at me. It's gonna be fine. Okay. Okay. We're gonna get out and walk around a little. Can you come with me? Of course. Okay. All right. This isn't permanent, is it? No, no, not at all. You're grieving, you know, not your child so much as the dream associated with the child. Definite feelings of guilt. And then you play it over and over again, and then you think about, okay, well, should we have not gotten divorced? Should we have worked harder on our marriage? Did that, you know, make it harder on him? So there was all these things along the way where it was like, if I had kept him on a steady diet, more holistic from the beginning, could this have been changed or the outcome could have been different? So. As a parent, you will be blamed. You'll be blamed for your child's struggles. Um, you'll be told, oh, you should just take parenting classes. That will fix it. For decades, we claimed that children developed autism because they had cold refrigerator mothers who were somehow pushing them into autism that they had schizophrenia because they had parents who nurtured an unconscious wish that they not exist. If we go back a few hundred years, we insisted that parents caused um, dwarfism and other deformities, which were a manifestation of the mother's unexpressed lascivious longings. And we've dropped the narrative of blame in all of those situations. But we still blame parents when their children are deeply troubled, and especially if they're deeply troubled in ways that involve criminal or destructive behavior. If your child has cancer, the whole community rallies around you. But mental illness is not a casserole disease. Nobody brings you a casserole when your child's in the acute care psychiatric hospital. There was a time when you spoke only in hushed terms of people with serious physical illnesses like cancer. She's got cancer, you know? And today, you know, anywhere you go, Somebody's having a fundraiser for somebody with cancer. You know, we're having rallies. We're doing things that are very, very inspiring. And people give great testimonials about the way they fought battles and overcome these serious physical ailments, whether it's cancer or diabetes or, or any sort of disease. We need, we need to do the same thing with mental illness. I would like to see him in some after-school programs. I think he needs to be around other kids his age because he's never had anything like that. I think he needs to be out more, but I want him out with some structure. I don't want to just, I don't want him just out on the streets. The reason I'm afraid is because before I got help and before I got on medication, I was like that. I would just snap and things would happen and I'm sitting in jail like, wow, how did I get here? How did this happen? What exactly did happen? Everything Vante is going through, I've been through that and I'm still kind of going through it, you know, but I'm older now, you know, I am, I'm older now and he's still young and I'm like, if I had got the help at his age, I think I'd be okay today. I think I'd be okay today, but I can't get his mental health team to step it up or get him into some programs. They not hearing me.
My name is Ethan. Ethan, and I am a great kid. Sometimes mom, dad, or my teacher will tell me to clean up or do my work. Sometimes they will tell me what to do. Sometimes I get mad. Mm. Yeah. I'm going home in three months. It's up to the staff. So I don't go home for a while. Because, you know, I'm never going to ho go home yet until, you know, I keep working on my behavior. But, you know, I'm still learning and... Yeah. I swiped my belt, but then they took my belt away. At least they let me keep my other belt, but only if I'm safe. Why did you swipe your belt at the door? Because you know, I got super angry. And, but that was a long time ago, so. Yeah. What happens if you're good? Can you go heaven? Even if you weren't, can you go heaven? Well, I mean, even if you aren't good, you still can go heaven? I don't know all the answers to those questions. Well, you could go to hell when you don't behave. I mean, hell's underground. Is that something you're worrying about? Well, what do you mean? I'm, I'm, I'm not worried about nothing. Okay. So. Come in. Hi. It's two o'clock. Are you ready to move on with your schedule? Gus was probably the most capable person I've ever, ever knew. He was, he was able to do anything he wanted to do and do it at a, high, at a very high level. He um, made movies with his friends, and he, he, he could speak any language he put his mind to learn in. He could play any instrument he wanted to learn. He, 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 was, he was unbelievable. You go through pictures, you look at things, you think about things. I, I had lots of good times with Gus. He, he, he contributed a lot, and he, he impacted so many lives. Nobody else in the family really thought there was a problem. In October of, of 2013, you know, I noticed on Facebook he, he was just, you know, I, I, he um, was concerned about um, professors ganging up, ganging up on him. And I was, um, I knew that wasn't Gus. But he started cutting his friends off, and then he just started behaving erratically. Well, the next thing I know, he's decided to come home. He's to leave school. I mean, maybe I didn't accept how sick he was. I mean, I, I, I know that I didn't. But I, I didn't expect violence. Can I talk to mommy? Can you go get mommy? Okay. Do you want to go get her? Thank you. I'll wait. Go ahead, go, mommy. Go get mommy. I, I think Cesar spoke to you, or he went to the school on, on the 28th of October. And Bonte was still here. So what happened? I know that you were struggling with him, right, again, with the Yeah, school and actually, and I just came downstairs from with the manager because you know, since she found out who's been lighting the fires, mm -hmm. now I gotta pay for all the carpet that's been burned. Uh -huh. And when I talked to another little boy in the building, mm -hmm. and he he did admit that Vonte was setting fires. Wow. So I'm like, he can't come back here. We'll get evicted. She already gotta report this to the owner, so I don't know what they're gonna do with us. Right. We're gonna have to pay for the damages, which mm -hmm. I don't have money to pay for the damages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What happened with the therapist? Was that even helpful? Was no, she still you coming know what they here? tell me? Uh -huh. 
They tell me, because I've been getting on their case, I'm like, you guys, because he started spiraling mm -hmm. down. And I'm like, you guys going to have to do something. Mm -hmm. I was like, I've been really emphasizing and really pushing them to get him in some after-school programs. Mm -hmm. I was like, he needs to be in an after-school right. program, and he needs to be in something to keep mm -hmm. him busy on the weekends. I've been saying it, saying it, saying mm -hmm. it. Nobody's doing anything. Mm -hmm. So when they come over and when I start talking to them and really, like, pressing them, mm -hmm. they was like, well, we don't know what to do with him because he won't open up to us and mm -hmm. you know I'm like well if you can't do it find somebody that can do it mm -hmm. you know if you mm -hmm. saying you can't reach him he's not opening up then mm -hmm. refer him somewhere else he what has that? not seen a psychiatrist obviously he's crying out for help I'm not a professional so I can't give all I can do is be a mother right you know that's all I can be but he needs more than a mother he mm -hmm. needs some serious professional help mm -hmm. You know, I just learned right now that um, there was a conference call uh, with the therapist, and one of the recommendations was to increase his mental health services and also a referral to a psychiatrist, and it doesn't seem like it happened. So I'm going to call right now if I know what happened with that. Um, you know, I'm calling in regards to a uh, minor who I've been working with, uh, him and his mother. It, it's been a while. I mean, Probably about maybe two months ago, there was a, a teleconference with one of our supervisors and CSAR in regards to making a referral to a psychiatrist. So, yeah. you know, what happened with that referral? And, and see, if we would have had that information, uh, it would have been very helpful because if we had to take mom to get the physical exam that Bonten needed, we would have done that. If in the if future you get a case and you have a, a problem with that, please let us know and we'll do that because it's been a year and he hasn't been seen by a psychiatrist. That's pretty, yeah. So it was all based on the paperwork and a, and a, and a uh, physical exam that was never taking place. What do you mean it was all? Well, I mean, said? I mean, the, him being seen by a psychiatrist, it was they, they were just waiting for a physical exam, like the results of a physical exam. That's all they were waiting for. So throughout this whole thing, don't forget to breathe, okay? Clench your fists real tight and hold it for 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Tense the muscles around your forehead by raising your eyebrows as far as you can, just like that. And hold it, hold it right there real tight. Don't forget to breathe. 10. The problem nine, that we face most of all is seven, that we're still in love with the magic bullet. We still think there's going to be a pill, or there's going to be a psychotherapy, or there's going to be a critical insight. If somebody says the right thing to the right person at the right time, they're going to be well. That works great in Hollywood, doesn't actually work that well in real life. These are really complicated problems. It takes time, but it also takes a lot of different converging kinds of interventions, and that could include medicine, education, skill building, what we call cognitive retraining. That's what you need for recovery. It's not going to be simple. Are you working on your behaviors? It's some part, yeah. Do you think you're like learning to try to not get so angry or control that a little bit more? Well, kind of. May I say hi to Alexa? Oh, honey, you could say hi to Alexa, but Alexa's outside playing. Okay, well, I love you, baby. Mwah. Bye, 
Hey, why don't you tell me how your uh, therapy's going? Uh, what do you mean? Wendy. Good. I don't know, I haven't really talked to you about it. So, what do you like about her? I'm nice. That's good. What do you guys do? Play a board game. You play board games? And we talk. What are you talking about? My diary, Mommy. I can't tell you. Um, no, okay, when I said she's like your diary, I meant that she can't tell me what you talk about. That doesn't mean you can't tell me if you wanted to tell me. I can't tell you what I said to her. Well, you can tell me if you want to tell me. Well, I don't want to tell you. Nothing? Not anything? Do you feel like you cannot talk to me about stuff? Yeah. Why? Because you always say comments about it. No, I don't. Mm-hmm. What I mean is, I hope you don't feel like you can't tell me things, because you can. I do. Can you explain to me why you want to take medicine and think it's so cool? everyone else does. Who's everyone? All my friends. Ethan takes medicine every day because it helps him calm down. Then can I do that? No. Because you don't need that kind of help. Oh, well, I can't calm down sometimes. Yeah, all people get angry and sad and hyper... Mad. And mad. Well, that's angry. Because of their mother. I'm kidding. <laughs> It kind of feels like they favorite him over me, but I know that they kind of have to put a lot of time and effort into dealing with him. Sometimes, like, I would want them to, like, I would, sh for example, like, show them something I did at school, like homework or a project or something, but it would kind of be like they were kind of always busy, had something with William, busy with William, just always something with him, always. I think she needs a lot more attention than a typical person her, at her age. It's really important that we give it to her or it's really upsetting to her. You know, like watch me do this and watch me do that. And he gets special treatment. You know, he doesn't get grounded like she gets grounded. The rules are different. And I think that's the one thing she resents, is that the rules are different for him than they are her, and they have to be. Answer. A-N-S-W-E-R. State. S-T-A-T-E. Several. I know this one. S E. V E R A L. I'm excited that he's coming home, and I'm kind of worried that he's gonna be bad still. Like, he's gonna yell and stuff and hit me. I did get the door replaced. It was broke, hole inside, and I did fix the hole in the wall that he made. So he had punched a hole in the wall and I did get that fixed. So yeah, I tried to make it look nice and clean and new again as much as I could for him when he came home. You know, I hope that he doesn't re-destroy anything <laughs> after all the work I've put in and the money I'm spending, but you know, I wanted him to hopefully I want to have a kind of a fresh star and a clean star, a clean slate, so to speak. So this is really sad. Now that I have to fold all these clothes, I can absolutely see in this past six months just how much weight I've put on. I don't think any of these fit me anymore. I think it was the feeling of, you know, having six months of thinking you need to like start marking things off your bucket list to like feel like that because your son is away from home is something else. I'm going home today. I've heard this song before. <laughs> yeah, turn it up, please. Turn it up? A little bit, okay? Yes, I like this song. Do you? I miss the song. <laughs>
Hey. Your hair's all wet. Yeah, I spiked it. Can I have a hug? Mm, spiked it for me. Do I get a hug? Yeah. Hi. Are you okay? No, I'm okay. Mm. I thought you'd be excited to be home. No, no, I am. Can you read that for me? Home expectations. I will listen to adults. I will respect everyone in their property and will not take things without asking permission. I will always be safe. I will keep my hands to myself. I will use my inside voice. When I get upset, I will ask for a break. I need you to try to remember these rules and your coping skills. Are you looking at me? Can I have a kiss? I missed you. Can you believe you're home? Are you staying overnight? Mm-hmm, I'm you staying forever. <laughs> I hope so. My God, how much gel did you use? The bottle? William's been home about two months, and at the beginning he was doing great, and he was happy and uh, really controlling his behavior, and we had some set up structure for him that he followed really well. Um, and then slowly he started wanting to take back his personal freedoms and decided to put up more of a fight, and so some of the nights were pretty intense. We've had to call the police a couple times on him. Yeah, pretty much the money issue is the main reason why William was like, go from the home. Medicaid doesn't want to pay. When we had our meetings, you have Brian who's saying this child needs to be in the home at least a year you know, if not until he's 18, because he wants to see long-term progress, you know. Brian's thinking, who is this person going to be when he's 25? And what's the best way to make him a productive member of society? And that would be a long-term retraining of everything that, that he's, you know, had to unlearn and relearn. The county is looking at, well, he's been in for 120 days. He's been in for 186 days, and they're counting days and to them, the days are dollar signs. And so it seemed every time we had a meeting, it was the mental health professionals saying, this is what he needs, and then the people paying it saying, you know, well, he's not hurting anybody, he's not hurting himself, let's send him home. Kidding! Your ass isn't that well. It's pretty big, but uh, I'd still do you with the lights off. Where the f did that come from? Sometime that spring, Gus was agitated and twitchy, and um, one word answers at best. His behavior was just very erratic, very erratic. You know, and by that I mean, you know, he would just, he would, um, he was skin and bones then. One morning, and I was coming out of the feed room, and Gus was just walking across the yard. And I said, hey, bud, um, how'd you sleep? or I said, hey, bud, good morning, or something like that. And I, I said, hey, bud, how'd you sleep? And he said, um, fine. And I turned around, and you know, I, he was on me. And I, I, I turned around. Once I, you know, I guess I dropped the feed bucket, but I, I got back around, and I said, you know, I, I said, what's going on, bud? I love you so much. And he didn't say anything. 
As we speak right now, he is in critical condition. State Senator Cree Deeds has been stabbed inside of his home. And the death of his son and what police are investigating as an attempted murder-suicide. Behind the blue lights blocking the Deeds driveway is a case that perplexes even police as investigators search for answers. That night before, and it was just very clear he was in crisis. He said to me at one point, he just, uh, he, he just talked about, he talked about suicide. I brought Gus to the hospital. Gus was examined and they determined that he needed, he was in crisis and he needed a bed, but that there weren't beds available. Deeds had to get a court order, but the emergency custody would run out in six hours, and a representative of the local community services board told Deeds they couldn't find a bed. I looked at the guy and said, the system failed my son tonight. He said, what? He got very, really defensive about it, but, you know, but it, it, it did. I knew Gus would not be happy with me. He would feel like I betrayed him. So I was worried. I was, I was a little scared coming back. I didn't expect the sort of situation. I didn't expect that, uh, but I, I, I was a little worried. I can't get Gus back. No matter what I do, I can't get him back. He's gone. I know that, that he would have been alive for longer if we could have found him a bed that night. But I was blessed, so fortunate to have him in my life for 24 years. Nice. It doesn't matter. You oh. don't do that. And as soon as I got off the phone, Dad, it was your parent choice time. Do you want to lose it? This is my room. No, this isn't your room. Don't smile at me like that. That's enough. Don't you touch the damn TV. That is enough. Give me, give, don't touch the damn One, TV. One, give me the controller now. Two, remember when you said you could go back to CCSS? You piece of shit. I don't have a TV in there. Yeah, you do. I will use this gun. Oh my God, get oh, out of my room. You, get, you freaking want me to shoot you gun? I'll shoot that freaking gun. Okay, you. enough. Stop that freaking bitch. Don't you shoot you're, you know, you're hurting me, you realize that? Then don't, you turn my Wii off. What was the first rule? You lost your Wii, you will not have it tomorrow. And you will not have the TV. You are not no. going to tell me boss around. I will. Get, get in my I'm going to get the gun. If you don't <laughs> shut the fuck up. I. One. Don't shut the fuck up. Two. Go. Shut up. <laughs> you need to calm down. Are you okay? Let's go. Do you need anything else? You want me to make you cry? Then shut the fuck up. You're hurting me. I tell my students that, I'll ask them the question, let's say that you have a breakdown. Um, what would you do? What would your family do? And they invariably say, oh, well, we'd, we'd call the, the doctor and you'd go to the hospital. And I say, this isn't true. You'd call 911 and the police would come. And if you were lucky, you'd live through that encounter and they'd take you to jail. There really isn't a good way to get help for people. I mean, uh, my dad put me in juvenile detention and he said he did it because he was trying to help me and he loved me. At the time, I didn't understand what he was saying and I hated him for it. But now I realize that 70% of people in juvenile detention had a severe mental illness. Tierra, you need to come and take care of Tristan. I'm falling to pieces over here. I'm, 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 I'm falling to pieces. I can't keep it together in here. I am falling, I'm crumbling, falling to pieces, and I need for somebody to take care of Tristan. All right.
Where is Vontae? I don't know. I tried to call the social worker, but he not answering, so I don't know. All I know is they was taking him to a command post last night, so I don't know where he's at. Actually, I won't know until either he calls or the social worker calls. Yeah, he called me about 12.30. And um, he left a message saying that he got put out of the group home and that he was at a gas station at a pay phone. And um, he didn't have nowhere to go. So the next morning I got up and I called the group home and the group home the guy answered the phone. He said that uh, Vontae wasn't no longer with them and that he AWOL'd. And he told me it was better, best for me to call the social worker. So I called the social worker and Mark says, you know, he don't know anything about this. And he was like, so where is Vontae? And I'm like, I don't know. I called you because I thought you knew where he was. This is Mark, the social worker. Hello? Hi, Mark. Where is Vontae? I said, where is Vontae? He's at your office? Okay, so, uh, so what happens now? Oh, is there a number where I can call so I can, because I need to make sure that he's okay and I need to be able to keep in touch with him because I don't want him lost in the system. I don't want him lost in the system, so I would like a number or something where I can keep up, you know, where, where he's at. Do you know what jail is really like? Do you have any clue? I've seen some shows. Yeah. Jail is almost like punishment more than it is a, a, a place to get better. I know. Because in jail you have to do hard work. You have to work for the cops. So basically in jail you basically become a slave to the community. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. It's basically just slavery. It's Overnight slavery. It's kind of true, honey. And I think part of the reason there's a jail, honey, yeah, is to keep people like that, yeah, away from the public, to keep the public safe yeah. from people like that. That's what I think. Okay. He's fascinated with jail. I think on some level he feels like someday he'll be there, and so it's almost like he's preparing himself. Um, and because he knows that his behaviors would be jail behaviors if he wasn't special needs. And there's going to come a time where they're not going to give him that kind of grace. That's a key, man. Good boy. Even though he looks like a girl, he's a boy. Yeah, it looks like a girl. Yeah, that's what we were hiding in Lysa. Yeah. That looks hard so bad. A cat? Right. Um, 20 weeks, five months. Still kind of surreal, really. I'm only just barely starting to feel her move, and either way, it's a very big gap between the two kids I have now, so just feels all brand new again. He has not laid a hand on me anything like he ever did before since I told him I was pregnant. He has really shown a lot of strength. I mean, I've 
I've got him in situations where normally he would have he would flip out on me and and he's really showed a lot of restraint. Bail bonds. Hold on just a moment. Bail bonds. You know, I'm brutally honest about things and I really don't try to sugarcoat anything and I don't try to hide anything and I I'm not going to say he's 100% better. He's not. I'm really happy that he I feel like he's come a little ways. I just am being honest that he still has a long ways to go. You know, I don't think I'm doing anything so different as far as how I'm talking to him or the way I am with him, but he's becoming a little calmer at times. And I don't know, we changed his medicine too. So I, I think the medicine he's on now is a lot better. And I, I think that probably is playing a little bit of a part in it as well. Um, but I'm sure it's a combination of everything. I worry about him a lot, especially if he's getting, wherever he's getting these toy guns from, what I'm afraid of is, because he's tall, and, and, and Vante, because of his height, can be very intimidating to other people. So I'm afraid that they're gonna take the wrong perception of him because of his height and his record and all the trouble that he gets into and he's going around carrying toy guns and stuff like that. Oh God. I don't like, I don't like it. I don't like it. I'm like at a place now where I can help my kids. You know, now I can be, I can be, I feel like now I can be a mom. You know, and I can be a mom now. And I want Vontae to experience that. I want him to see the, be able to experience the new side of me. Cause I think it would help him. What's your, what's your biggest fear for William? An accident. Something like that, it makes me cry, yeah. Yeah. That I'll get a call. <laughs> so, you no. Know, I mean, he threatens sometimes, you know, cutting himself. What if he does it too hard one time? Um, or uh, he's hanging out with kids that are no good for him and something goes wrong. Um, so he's, he's like a lamb, you know, he's innocent. In my most hopeful moments, I see a brilliant mind. I see a sweet heart. And I see somebody that is so unique that um, there's nobody on the face of the earth like him. And if we could somehow channel that into something creative, that he can actually make a living for himself and that he can maybe live, you know, in a um, carriage house behind our house or something and ha actually have a decent life, you know, maybe even go to college or something like that. In those moments, I'm hopeful for him, you know, when I dream that. So, cautiously hopeless or hopeful, yeah, so. As I looked at Adam's path and the trajectory he was on, it was so similar to my son's. And the only thing where it started to change was with my blog post when I screamed to the world and said, hi, I need help. All of, our, all of these moms, we all need help. There is a sort of politics and a reality that are often in conflict. Most people with mental illnesses, most people with autism, most people 
with any of this variety of conditions, which we largely describe as brain diseases of one kind or another, will never hurt anyone. If we talk too much about those dangerous situations, we stigmatize people we shouldn't. If we take a politically correct standpoint and we don't acknowledge those situations, then we end up with families in which a child is terrifying and violent and nobody believes them and they don't understand what it is they have to deal with. It's a very fine balance we need to strike. I think what we forget most of all when someone is violent and when they have a serious mental illness is that we failed them. It's a little bit like if someone had diabetes and they go into coma. Um, that's part of the illness, right? But if they get treated, that should never happen, if they get treated well. And that's where we've, uh, we've let people down. We need to understand that treatment before tragedy is not only possible, but it should become our reality. And that's, it's gonna take some tough conversations. This is about helping people who are suffering. And we know that if we can get children treatment, we can change the whole course, not only of a child's life, but of an entire family's life. Oh, over here, you know, what kind of penguins are there? Hi, penguins. I wish one of them was going Come right on, now. watch. Absolutely. Look, I see one over there. Good afternoon. It's always polite to say that. You want to taste? You're welcome. I wouldn't go to heaven if I didn't share. If I don't share, I can't go to heaven. No, I can't actually. Well, you know why? Because in hell they're controlling you. Here, you want me to hold yours? Well, that's very nice of you, Ethan. Here, let me see. You want, you want? Oh, sorry. Oh, what, because you want to play with it? Mm.